Hey, it's Andre from High Performance Academy. Well, welcome along to another one of our webinars. Now, this time we're going to be having a look at how you can go about rescaling the mass airflow sensor if you are reflashing a late model factory car. Specifically, our example is going to be our GM L98 engine, pretty similar to an LS2 for all intents and purposes. And we are going to be using the HP Tuners tuning platform. However, to a reasonable degree, the techniques that we're going to look at and the principles behind it are going to be applicable to a wider range of vehicles as well. So something for just about anyone into reflashing modern engines that are fitted with mass airflow sensors to learn. Before we get into that though, I just want to continue on with a few things that have been happening around the shop over the last week. And for those who did join us last week, you'll know that I was talking about our latest acquisition, which is a version 11 Subaru STI. We're intending to use this for creation of some course material. Specifically, we're going to be uh, performing some reflashing on this and it's really popular in the Subaru tuning market uh, to reflash. There's a lot of open source uh, software packages in particular that make it really cost effective for uh, home enthusiasts to reflash their own vehicle. Realistically your only cost there is the Tactrix open port cable to interface between your laptop and the OBD2 port. So we're excited about that vehicle and being able to bring some content out on it but of course we want to be able to tune this on a wide variety of platforms and uh, for starters we are getting our Haltech Elite 2500 installed in it. Uh, so we'll just swap across to my laptop screen for a moment. This is the vehicle again uh, for those who haven't seen it. Nothing particularly special. It's a 100,000 kilometre old 2008 Vision 11 STI in almost completely stock condition. All we've done to it is fitted a aftermarket exhaust system from the turbo back. Now this is the elite uh, package that we are fitting and it is an adapter harness which is what we can see whoops let's try turning my pointer on we can see our adapter harness here and the little adapter box that is there. So this goes between the Haltech harness and the factory header plugs for the ECU, and the stock ECU. Makes it nice and easy. There are a couple of problems with this though. One of them, and again I was talking about this a little bit uh, last week, so for those who have watched, sorry for doubling up, but uh, one of the problems is that this setup from Haltech is actually suited for the Australian domestic market 2.5 litre engine. Uh, we've got a Japanese domestic market model, that's what we predominantly see here in New Zealand, and there are some significant differences and one of those is that the uh, Japanese domestic market 2 litre engine is fitted with quad AVCS or uh, variable cam control so I've got variable cam control on the inlet and the exhaust the Australian domestic market 2.5 only had that at that version on the intake so we had to do a little bit of work on the adapter harness to add in those pins and one of the problems we struck with this uh, which I really wanted to talk about just in terms of diagnosis in general if you are an EF by tuner is that once we got up and running on the Haltech we found that we had really poor control over one of the inlet cams and one of the exhaust cams. Now of course because I'd made some wiring changes to this adapter harness straight away this was my suspicion. Turns out that was actually partly right as well. Uh, there was a problem on the exhaust side with one of the inputs that I'd, oh, sorry, one of the actuator outputs that I'd added in. But that didn't explain the fact that I was also having trouble on one of the intake cams and this was all completely completely factory through the Haltech adapter harness. So it, it's always a good idea when you're in a situation like this, if you can, to revert back to stock and just make sure that physically the system is capable of controlling. So what we're trying here is making sure that the mechanical system is physically able to control the engine. Uh, so we did this, we're using ECU Edit to do some scanning and if we head across to my laptop screen for a moment, uh, this is a log file from the, the engine on the stock. ECU. So I'll head across to the left hand side here and we can see that in our second group of graphs we've got our exhaust valve timing uh, position for left and right so that's the red and the white there and then we've got on graph three below that our intake cam position for left and right. Now these don't always track absolutely perfectly but in particular we can see around about here we've got quite a big discrepancy between our left and right for our exhaust. It's also showing quite serious change there uh, for our inlet and if we move across to the right a little bit this actually gets quite bad for our exhaust in particular we can see that the uh, red trace has moved quite a long way away from the white trace. 
Now, anytime we've got a discrepancy in our valve timing values or our cam, t cam angles between one bank of cylinders and the other, we're going to have a big problem with the volumetric efficiency of the engine is going to be different bank to bank. One cylinder bank is going to end up running richer or leaner than the other. And just generally this results in a lot of ugly drivability problems and rough running. So we don't want this. And just remembering again, this is the situation we were facing in stock form. Now, for those of you who are Subaru fanatics, you'll know that this isn't actually an unusual usual situation for these engines, particularly when they are high kilometer examples. And a lot of this can come down to the uh, way the car's been cared for, whether it's had regular maintenance, regular oil changes, and whether it's been well looked after. Now, despite the fact that ours did look like it's been in pretty good condition, uh, we obviously have this problem. So a little bit of research here showed a few options along with talking to a few other Subaru specialists that I deal with here in New Zealand. Uh, so what we ended up doing was an engine flush, uh, which is an additive we put into the oil. Basically this problem can be down to basically sludge build up uh, in the oil system. So uh, anything that's going to slow down the ability of those cams to actually react and move as well as the ability of the uh, solenoids to actually do their job properly. Uh, after that we also ran through an oil change of a diesel oil. Uh, diesel oil has a higher detergent content than a norm normal uh, oil that we would use for a gasoline engine. So we ran this through the engine a few times, got it nice and hot a few times, cycled that and uh, ran it through so that the cams were cycling and this was just a case of uh, basically taking it out for a short drive, making sure that we're varying both the RPM and load. And uh, we'll just head back across to my laptop screen again. So this is the final log that we did yesterday I think it was, uh, after no changes other than those oil changes uh, and the oil flush. So we can see straight away that on both banks of cylinders, this is again our exhaust, you can see how much closer everything's tracking there and our intake. I've still got a few small discrepancies but this is more in line with what we would expect to see. So this dealt with one of the problems we've now got on top of the fact that even on the factory ECU we know that the uh, system is capable of controlling the cam angle. Now we can swap back over to the Haltech and we're confident that if there is an issue it's either in our wiring or it's in the ECU control strategy. So this highlighted that we still had a problem on one of the exhaust cams and this was down to uh, basically where I've modified the adapter harness it turned out that uh, we had reallocated a pin that was also doing another function uh, on the factory dash. So by disabling that we've got our cam control functioning now so we're hoping to get this, this car on the dyno tomorrow and get a bit of a baseline tune in it with the Haltech Elite 2500 and of course as soon as we can we're going to be bringing out some more content on that and we will be using that adapter harness to adapt this up to a range of ECUs. One of the other ones we're really excited about is getting it up and running on our ECU Master Black. We've had quite a lot of people requesting tuning information and webinar content on the ECU Master product so we're excited to get that out. Now, last week I was also talking about our Toyota 86. This is the V8 swapped Toyota 86, and we're at the moment in the process of fitting a TTI six-speed sequential gearbox. And this has actually been a real uh, difficult job, something we thought was going to be a lot easier than it was. And some of this is made difficult by the fact that the Toyota 86 transmission tunnel is really, really tight. So the first problem we had was physically getting the existing R154 Toyota gearbox out. Uh, there was not enough room unfortunately to pull the gearbox back off the engine and get it clear of the engine and as well as the clutch, the twin plate clutch, and uh, drop it out. So we actually ended up going through what was quite a rigmarole. We had to drop the engine down on the cross member around about uh, 50 mil to allow us enough room to actually get the gearbox out. Now the good news is that the uh, TTI box is much smaller in its width, so we're not going to have that issue, and we'll just jump across to my laptop screen, we can see the two boxes side by side, so at the back there uh, we've got the existing R154 gearbox. I'll point out that these never came out behind the 1UZFE, the 1UZFE always had an auto gearbox behind it, uh, so what we've got here is an adapter bell housing that is made here in New Zealand. Uh, this I think is a night speed part, but these are available uh, from... A 
a bunch of people all around the world just because these gearboxes are so popular. So there we've got our TTI box sitting in front of that and you can, you can quite easily see how much narrower the TTI box is. So that's great in terms of it gives us a lot more width to work with in the, the transmission tunnel. What's not quite so great though is straight away as soon as we uh, lifted up the gearbox and sort of got it into location we found that the protrusion at the top of this gearbox was going to foul on the underside of the transmission tunnel and in particular there is some bracing here that just perfectly coincides with where this is fitted. So we have got the car at fab at the moment and uh, again on our on our laptop screen uh, we've got a quick image of where we're at at the moment. So this is with the gearbox lifted into place and uh, hopefully you can see here that there's already been a little bit of cutting gone into removing the bracing from the transmission tunnel. This almost gets us close enough, close but frustratingly far away. Uh, we can get the gearbox in in this location but essentially it is touching the uh, top of the transmission tunnel. It's never going to work so there is going to be a little bit of cutting and a little bit of boxing of the transmission tunnel needed in order to give us enough clearance. But that will be the hard part once that's done uh, everything else fingers crossed should be pretty plain sailing. I'm not entirely sure why I said that because I've been dealing with race cars and cars in general long enough to know that there is very seldom any real plain sailing. Alright, uh, I also just wanted to show you an Instagram that I actually put up last night and, and this is a topic that I think is really important for any of you who are doing your own wiring. Uh, when you are dealing with some of the more mission critical uh, inputs to the ECU and basically anything that's high frequency here, here but the common ones would be uh, su aspects such as engine speed and position inputs, uh, wheel speed or also knock inputs, they do need to be run through shielded cable and that shield is there to help protect the conductors within the shield uh, from electromagnetic interference. The problem with this is for that shield to work properly we also need to ground the end of the shield at the ECU to drain that EMI away from those conductors and how we go about doing this is a little bit tricky if you don't know the techniques. Once you know, not too big a deal. So there's two techniques that we have got shown here. At the bottom we've got uh, basically two stages of the same technique and what we've done here is that we have stripped the uh, outer sheath off our braid and this re reveals our shield. And what we want to do here is basically use a small pick or a very very fine jeweler's screwdriver and just tease a small hole in that braid and basically we're going to extract the two conductor wires out of that hole that we've just created in the braid. And in essence this now gives us three individual wires. We've got our two conductors in this case, of course this is a uh, two core shielded cable. We could have a uh, single core, triple core or whatever you're actually working with. So we've got our two cores in this instance plus our shield. And what we've done here is we've used a conventional open barrel splice here to crimp an additional wire, which is our green wire, onto that shield. And this gives us a nice reliable connection to that shield and then we can terminate our new wire that we've just added in through that connection, through that crimp, uh, to our ground pin on our ECU to drain away that EMI. Now of course we can't leave it like this, there's two problems, we've now got an exposed crimp, our, our open barrel splice is exposed there, we don't want the risk of that uh, shorting out against anything. The other thing is, well we would like to give this a little bit of strain relief, so the next step of this process is we've used this black uh, dual wall heat shrink here, this is a product called SCL and this is a semi rigid product, so once it's recovered down using our heat gun, first of all it will, the uh, glue inside it melts which hopefully if you are looking on a big enough screen you'll be able to see that some of that glue has actually squeezed out you can see that at the bottom in particular. So that glues it essentially to the underlying conductors, make sure that it's not going to move. Also because it is semi-rigid it gives great strain relief there. So that's our first technique. The second technique which is shown at the top, this is probably one of the few areas that you will ever hear us recommend using a solder based product and this is a uh, solder sleeve.
So what we do here is we strip away our conductor, our outer sheathing again, and what we can do here is actually then uh, basically fold the shield back over the top of the sheath. We're then going to add our green wire again, that's obviously been stripped at the end, and we place the solder shield, which is again a heat recoverable boot or piece of uh, sh heat shrink for want of a better term, and it's got an adhesive sealant at both ends and then a ring of solder in the middle. And by recovering that down what happens is that that solder melts and it forms a nice reliable junction between the shield and the, uh, the piece of wire that we've added in. Now, of course there are problems with uh, solder that we're very vocal about. Why this works is because it is a very controlled amount of solder. It's not going to wick up that shield by miles and cause a problem. And the other really important aspect here is because it is a semi-rigid product when it is recovered, it's going to add strain relief there. So this is going to mean there's no vibration uh, associated with the solder joint and this makes sure that it's going to lead a long and reliable service life. So just a couple of tips there uh, for those of you who are wondering how you go about terminating those shields. Uh, also while I'm on it, probably important to mention here that when we are terminating shields like shielded cable like this, we only want to terminate this at one end and that's almost always going to be at the ECU end. Uh, so it's a, it's a big no-no to be shielding that at both ends. We can uh, end up with some big problems there if we, if we shield both ends. Alright, our last topic for today, I just want to mention that we have got another one of our giveaways running. Uh, so this time we have partnered up with the team from K1 uh, and they are providing any of their shelf stock aftermarket Conrod kits. So they've got kits for the majority of popular engines, both uh, import and domestic. So if you are considering embarking on an engine building project uh, and you are considering a set of rods, then this is perfect timing for you. You're going to get the set of rods as well as freight anywhere in the world. So it doesn't matter whereabouts you are based. You don't have to be in the US market. We will ship them anywhere in the world to you. We're also going to be chucking in our full suite of engine building courses. So this will give you our engine building fundamentals, our practical engine building course, and you'll also get access to our, our private online community consisting of our forums as well as our private members webinars. I'll get the guys to chuck a link down that you can follow if you want to get your name in the draw there. There's also a bunch of additional steps that you can take that are going to multiply the number of entries you get in that draw. So uh, all pretty easy, so give yourself the best chance possible. And as always, there's absolutely no cost involved with getting into that draw, so make sure you don't miss out. Alright guys, thanks for joining us there for our little pre-show. Give me a few moments and we'll get started with our webinar today.